All right. Um, I think there'll be some more people coming in, but we'll, we will get started now. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Hinken, and I'm the founder of The Humane Space. Um, our mission is to reconnect people to curiosity, wonder, and awe through lifelong learning and introspective thinking. We're incredibly excited tonight to welcome you to our first event in the space. Um, this event is exclusively for early supporters like you, um, many of whom I think probably signed up without having any idea what we are or who we are. So I want to personally thank you um, and let you know that we plan to have many more opportunities like this to engage with subject experts and each other. Um, our guest tonight is Dr. Joshua Hicks, um, a professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Texas A&M University. Um, he received his PhD in personality and social psychology at the University of Missouri. Um, his research aims to understand how people answer the big questions in life and how their answers to those questions influence their feelings and behavior. Specifically, his research examines um, the antecedents and consequences of the experience of meaning in life, authenticity, true self-knowledge and self-alienation, perceptions of free will and mortality awareness. Dr. Hicks has approximately 100 academic publications, and his work has been featured in Scientific American, The Washington Post, Vice Magazine, and NPR. And Josh, I'd love to just start by asking you, what are the big questions that people grapple with? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, you know, I think everyone has their own sort of big question, but I think there are these sort of main ones that people grapple with, and not all the time. I think most of the time people don't think about these things. Um, but I think things like, you know, what, what's my purpose here? You know, what's the meaning of my life? You know, does my life have any meaning? Um, who am I? That's sort of a big one, this, this idea of the true self, you know, whether or not that exists. Uh, I think people care about it. You know, they feel like, sometimes they feel like they're really in touch with the true self and that sort of leads to good things, it seems like. And sometimes they feel like, oh, you know, I don't know who I am. Um, and, you know, I think it all boils down to, you know, whether your life feels meaningful, basically. I think sort of that's the big question that most people, again, I'm a little bit hesitant to say grapple with because I think most people, they just feel like their lives are meaningful. It's during those certain times in life though, whether it's, whether you've had a traumatic event, whether you're going through a pandemic, whether it's, you know, these certain things that might make you question, really think about whether your life has meaning in some ways. And could you talk a little bit about the research that you've done into mystery or curiosity or, or these big questions? Yeah, so most of my research um, has looked at sort of either what leads to meaning, uh, the, the feeling that your life's meaningful. So by that, I just mean the subjective judgments of like when you, if I were to ask you, like, is your life meaningful? You know, some people would say yes, very much. And some people would say, yeah, I'm not sure. And some people would say, you know, not at all. And so, you know, we do a lot of experiments sort of trying to see what variables sort of influence that perception of meaning. Um, and so things like friendships need to, you know, feeling like you belong, just being in a positive mood, um, religiosity, um, those type of things lead to meaning, having a strong connection to the self seems like it does. Um, with mystery, you know, my work is, hasn't focused on it quite as much. It's more my sort of future interest in some ways. I've looked at a lot about awe though. And I think that's, uh, and look, how does awe relate to sort of these things? And we find that, you know, feelings of awe are definitely related to meaning in life. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, in kind of unique ways uh, sometimes. So for example, we've done some studies that when you induce awe feelings, you know, it leads to meaning uh, through some, you know, some of the things that awe does. So it may make you feel happy, for example, and that leads to more meaning, but it can also diminish your sense of meaning uh, in the moment too, because sometimes, you know, when you're, when you experience awe, it's sort of hard to make sense of what it is. You know, it's by definition of what awe experiences are. And sometimes that can be sort of, you know, elicit some fear maybe and some stuff and that could actually detract. For most people though, 
I think awe and wonder and all these things and curiosity are certainly, you know, really centrally related to our sense of meaning and predictive. I read like a, a um, I guess it was an article about what awe actually is yeah. or how you even describe awe. And it was interesting because it actually showed, I guess, in the research study that the article was about that awe is induced when when you feel small, I guess, in yeah. context to your surroundings. But is that how you define it? Yeah, I think that's a part of it. I think typically when people experience awe, they feel what people call a sense of a small self. And so you're not as self-focused in some ways. And that, that can be fearful, you know, if you feel like you're not, you know, on top of the world, you know, but it could also be very comforting too. And I think it really relates to meaning in a positive way because you feel more connected to things. And you're not sort of ego driven and just thinking about the self. You're thinking about, you know, being grounded and connected to the outside world. Um, whether it's nature, whether it's other people or and things like that. And so I, I think it's certainly part of it. You wrote uh, about a meaningful existence coming down to, to three factors. Um, the feeling that one's life is coherent and makes sense, the possession of clear and satisfying long-term goals, and the belief that one's life matters in the grand scheme of things. How did psychologists identify these, these factors? And I guess what psychologists call coherence, purpose, and existential mattering? Yeah. Is that, you know, is that right? Yeah. So I, people have sort of identified it in the literature. And one thing, prior to the mid 2000s, like 2005 or so, is when people actually started to empirically study meaning in life. And, you know, it was kind of a weird thing because one of the problems is like, what does meaning even mean? You know, it can mean different things in some ways. And so people have really um, did a lot of good research and a lot of good sort of thinking about what is it? What is meaning in life? And it's really, if you look at uh, old theoretical accounts, if you look at empirical articles from people who collect data, it really seems to boil down to these three things. And these three things are almost synonymous of meaning. They're so connected to it. And so feeling like your life makes sense, you know, it's coherent. Um, that's certainly an aspect of meaning. And that's really apparent when bad things happen, I think. Uh, you know, usually life makes sense to all of us. But, you know, if someone breaks up with you or if you lose a loved one or something like that, you know, then your world can turn upside down. You use that metaphor, but it really makes it feel like it doesn't make sense, I think. Um, the way the world should be, does it's not working that way. Purpose, uh, often people use purpose synonymously with meaning um, and some it's not quite the same thing, but certainly related in, in many ways and might be a, you know, a strong component of it. And it's really typically when think of purpose is, as you mentioned, you know, having these really clear goals, having really being goal driven. Um, and, you know, some people look at sort of your overall life purpose versus the small purposes you have. And there's not a big difference between the two. I think most of us have smaller purposes, maybe not this overarching purpose in life, um, but even those smaller purposes, feeling like you have aims and goals seems to matter. Um, you know, it predicts things like mortality 10 years later, if you have a high sense of purpose, some papers have shown. Hmm. And the last one is <laughs> what people have called to existential mattering. It's, um, you know, it's the idea that, you know, your actions, what you're doing right now matter. And I think they call it existential mattering because you can think about it in one way as sort of leaving a legacy or doing something, being generative. So, you know, your time right now, it's not just about you right now. You're going to have influence in other people in the world more broadly. Um, and so it, it that kind of makes sense too. Like if you would say my life's meaningful, certainly someone who's like influencing a bunch of people would probably say that. And they probably also say they they have a strong sense of existential mattering. If that makes sense. I I feel like you know um, I've read so many articles about um, you know you'll be happier if you do this or find happiness, but but I I I've read a couple books that talk about kind of the importance of finding me, a meaningful life rather than a happy life, and I'm just curious. If you have any thoughts about the difference between the two. Um... Yeah, you know, that's a great question. A lot of people have tried to tease apart those two things, especially in the past decade. It's only been a decade, even though, you know, people, the old philosophers have been talking about this stuff for a long time. 
Um, you know, what's more important? I don't know if any, they're both important, you know, in their own thing. And they're both very related to each other. I personally think that it's hard to feel like your life's meaningful if you're not happy to, if you don't have a sense of happiness. And we know that because if we, we manipulate positive moods, for example, it actually gives people a momentary increase in meaning in life. Uh, most of my graduate training, you know, a long time ago was really focused on that. And so it's, they, they seem to be tied to each other. I think happiness is a part of meaning. That said though, I think meaning itself, you know, can help you get through tough times as people like Viktor Frankl have said. So you don't have to be happy to necessarily have meaning in some way. So if you have a purpose, um, you know, if you feel like your life matters on that, you don't have to be as you know, super happy by any means. And that, that sort of sense of meaning can maybe help you, um, you know, just gives you a sense of resilience, I guess. Do you feel like it's like a more sustaining kind of, kind of thing? Yeah. Happy, I, it might be a, m a more kind of temporary yeah. feeling. Yeah, that's what some people have argued actually. And I think that there's there's some validity to that. It seems like your happiness, you know, it fluctuates throughout the day. Of course, there's some people that are happier than other people, you know, dispositionally, uh, but it can fluctuate. And, you know, if that's the case, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, yeah, meaning, I think it's probably less likely to fluctuate, especially that real sense of meaning. If you really have clear purpose, for example, um, if you really feel like your life matters, if you're working at a nonprofit or you're doing whatever you're doing, I think that, you know, it's hard to change that as much, I think. So. And um, I'm really like, what do you think happens to us when we experience beauty, for example? Yeah, so I think what happens to us and why I think it's so related to meaning. Um, and so what I've argued is like beauty is like another sort of dimension of meaning in some way. So you have coherence, purpose and existential mattering, but I think experiencing beauty or appreciating beautiful things is another important part of feeling like your life's meaningful, um, independent of those things. And I feel like what happens, you know, obviously it feels good. I and mean, when you appreciate things, when you're uh, experience things, um, but I think it also importantly gives you, just makes you feel really connected to things. Uh, again, uh, going back to awe itself, and you don't have to experience awe, I think, to necessarily experience beauty. It's probably part of it, but you feel it's sort of a self-transcendent sort of feeling in some ways when you experience something, some beauty in the natural world or wherever you experience beauty. I, and so you feel connected to things. You're not just thinking about yourself and, you know, your, what you have and what you don't have and what you, you know, who you, you wish you were and all these other things that are sort of ego driven. You know, you're just thinking about, you're sort of just in the moment, you know, thinking about whatever it is, feeling connected to it. Do you think that what we find to be beautiful is learned or is instinctual? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I think, My guess is like there's, you can cultivate a sense of beauty in, in terms of like, if you think about mindfulness or things like that, where you can slow down, you know, and you can notice things. You have to notice that first, right? To interpret it as beautiful, you know, whether it is, it's the trees or, you know, a, you know, a, a awe-inspiring place or wherever it is, or just seeing a conversation even, you know, and just you're like really appreciating that conversation. Even if it's not about you, just appreciating whoever's doing it, you know, what, where they come from and so forth. I think some people, it's probably hard to appreciate it because they're all too self-focused, you know, or maybe they have, you know, too negative, you know, sense of self and so forth. It's hard to appreciate that. And so to the extent that you can change that disposition, change people sort of what they attend to, I think you can make them appreciate you more. But um, <clears throat> that's a good question though. Like, are there things that are more inherently beautiful than others? My guess is nature, you know, natural things are probably more inherently beautiful. Things that, that, as you mentioned, that have a little mystery involved with them too, you know, they're kind of novel in some ways, I think can be beautiful um, and, uh, and things like that, I think. Yeah, I, I guess I'm curious because I think if we, if you showed people a picture of the Grand Canyon next to a picture of, you know, um, some kind of in, industrial landscape, yeah. In most cases, they would choose the, the Grand Canyon as what they would define as as beautiful. And I'm yeah. I, I'm just I'm really curious if that is what we're you know we're taught to think of as beauty. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I don't know. I assume that it's not necessarily taught as much. I think that's probably, you know, that we, we inherently think about some of these things as being beautiful in some ways. There was a great um, quote that I, I found in, in getting ready for this, this talk by Agnes Martin, who um, was a, a great artist. She wrote an essay in 1989 called Beauty is the Mystery of Life. And she said, when a beautiful rose dies, beauty does not die because it is not really in the rose. Beauty is an awareness in the mind. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what you think about how important is it for us to experience beauty? Like what impact does it have on us? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think it's really important. That, that's actually a really interesting, great quote. You know, it is sort of in the mind of the beholder in some ways, you know, we interpret things differently. Um, and I think that it, I think it's so important because I think especially in this day and age where we're so fast paced and, you know, we're connected to so many different things. It's hard, you know, it's easy just to go about your day to day life and not really, you know, appreciate things and appreciate just walking, you know, the, the changing of the seasons or something, you know, like that. You know, it's hard, you know, it's really easy for lots of people to sort of you know, miss out on those things. It's always. How do you think COVID has impacted our ability to experience all of these things that we're talking about? Beauty, yeah. meaning in, in life, curiosity, wonder, all, all, all yeah. of them. So I think it's, unfortunately, it's had, you know, a different effect depending on different people. I think it's uh, COVID, we've ran some studies, I know there's a lot of studies, it's showing that it's actually exacerbated disparities. Like, so people lower on SES, um, you know, status, for example, are less likely to, you know, they have to work, they might have lost a job, you know, they're more stressed out. All those things are gonna detract from your ability to detect beauty in the environment and probably detract from your sense of meaning. And so the people that were already, I don't want to say struggling by any means, but you know, that, that were hit harder by COVID. I think it's really hurt them. And I think for some people, you know, I, I was, I'm, you know, fortunate, I guess, I guess I'm privileged in some ways, you know, that, you know, I, I could work from home. You know, I've went during COVID happened when we had lockdown, um, you know, my kids were home and, you know, I just, it was a better chance. I still, you know, three years into it, say that, you know, it's really changed me for the better, I think, you know, I think I've really slowed down in many ways and sort of appreciate different things in many different ways. And I think for some people that, you know, that can actually is led to a, a greater sense of meaning, or at least a greater clear values, which is certainly related to me, uh, values and sort of things, you know, what you really appreciate, what's really important to you. Um, so for some people, I think it did that. For other people, I think, you know, it's probably harder for them to do that because of the situation. Unfortunately, if they're struggling, if they lost someone they loved, if they, um, you know, lost their job and things like that. And so it's probably, you know, there's probably, a, it did a lot of things to everyone, I think. I think COVID didn't, you know, uh, you know, everyone was affected by COVID, has been affected by COVID, obviously. Some people, I think it's enriched their sense of meaning. Some people, you know, it probably hasn't very much and it might have make, make it more stressful, certainly. Do you think that transcendent experiences need to be grand? Like, do they, do they have to be in awe inspiring places, do you think? I don't think so. I mean, that your, your poem with that rose suggests it doesn't necessarily. And I think, you know, when you slow down and you see, uh, you know, the other day I was with my seven-year-old and we were just looking at like spider webs, you know, out, you know, out in our thing, you know, it sounds weird, but you know, it's like, they can be really beautiful looking at them and just looking at, you know, how they come about really quickly and so forth. And I think, you know, I appreciate it, but I think my seven-year-old really appreciate it. You know, he found it, you know, he was in awe of that little spider web. And I think that we could, you know, we could all experience more awe. You know, I think we should be able to, again, if you focus on things, if you have a more grateful mindset, um, you know, a little bit less ego driven, I think that we can experience it more. One of the um, experiments that you talked about that I, I found particularly fascinating was when you asked people to look at an awe inspiring video, like a nature video, 
yeah. compared to, I think it was a more instructional video, like a woodworking, I think yeah. was the, the video that you compared it to. Um, and uh, like, do you think people need to um, experience these things in the real? Or do you think that, um, that they, like to what degree can an awe-inspiring moment be simulated? Yeah, that's a really wonderful question. And to be honest, I'm always skeptical of these studies, even when I do them, that they're going to work. You know, what's watching a video on the screen for two minutes versus another one. But we didn't, you know, other people have done those videos, probably 30 studies now, you know, 30 different papers that I've used. And it seems to elicit awe. My feeling is it's not a very strong, you know, like the most authentic form of awe that you could experience watching a video that being out, you know, in nature, uh, seeing something for the first time. Uh, certainly is stronger. So it's a more artificial way of experiencing awe. Um, of course, there's probably ways of, of doing it better, you know, reading something that sometimes you read something I feel like, and it's like, whoa, I never thought about that. You know, that's why I like your app, for example, you know, all these little, little tidbits that it has, you know, I think that can sort of make you experience awe sometimes. Well, I still think going outside, you know, going outside, interacting with people, you know, trying new food, trying, you know, all these different things, different experiences, you know, listening to good music uh, is, is really key though, I think. Do you think that um, having those experiences be new experiences are a, like, that's a component that is important in that experience? I think it certainly, it helps when something's novel um, you know, we pay attention to it more, focused on it more, we're trying to process it more. Um, but again, I think if you cultivate that mindset, you know, of like, okay, I'm going to actually, you know, it sounds, I'm going to appreciate this spider web. I'm going to appreciate this, you know, this thing. I, no one can do that for 24 hours a day, obviously, or how many day, hours you're waking up, but just a little bit more than you already are doing. I think it's really important in some ways. Are you already um, mapping out tests for virtual reality, <laughs> awe-inspiring experiences in virtual reality. Yes, yeah, we, we've been talking about that quite a bit. Uh, and so, and some people have already started doing that. Uh, I think uh, some researchers have started doing it. And I think that's sort of our next step, uh, doing some awe research. Um, we just ran a study uh, with the undergraduate and a grad student where we, um, you know, here's a little sort of, small effect of awe, where we had just had people, we gave them questionnaires at Texas A&M, there's this community gardens. And it's a really pretty area where they, we just had people who are walking through the gardens complete these questionnaires versus people walking in a parking lot, you know, that was really close to the gardens. And we found that it, it's not surprising the people that are walking in the, the gardens area, which is not, it's not like the Grand Canyon, but it's still pretty, you know, it's still kind of interesting. They report more experiential appreciation you know, they, they report uh, feeling like, you know, connected to beauty and connected to nature and so forth. I know you, you said that a lot of your research has been about awe and, you know, I have trouble sometimes articulating, I guess, the difference between awe, wonder, curiosity, like even trying yeah. to talk about the humane space. And, you know, yeah. I talk about it all, all the time, all day. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm curious about how you see the difference between, between yeah. those. I, so I see them, if you think about a Venn diagram, I think they're all have some relationship to each other. I think wonder and curiosity seem to be more related to each other. I think awe, you know, if, if you think about people who have defined awe and the definition, it's really, Again, feeling small, feeling, you know, like you can't comprehend it necessarily. You know, like if say you're in the Grand Canyon for the first time, it's you're thinking about it, you're trying to make sense of it, uh, you know. And, and so, again, it's not a bad thing by any means, but it, it could, it feels different than other things. So the other things, curiosity and wonder, I feel like they're more related to sort of like you're approaching it. You know, you're, you're attempting to make sense of this thing, whereas awe, you're just, it's like, it, it's hard to make sense of it. You know, it's so I think awe, you know, after you experience awe, I don't know how long after, to be honest, but, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, then you start to think about things, you know, then you start to think about, you know, curious about why it exists or why it happened or, you know, things like that. So I think, I think there's certainly a little bit different. I, I've always thought about wonder too, you know, as sort of a bigger form of curiosity. And I don't know if other people think that, but, you know, I always think about it as like, 
you know, wonder about, you know, why are we here? You know, why are we doing this? And it's certainly curiosity is related to that, but I could also just be curious about, you know, Wordle or something, you know, something like that, or, you know, something that's not necessarily related to wonder. That makes sense. And that, that's yeah. just my own differentiation of them. But. I, I guess sometimes I think of curiosity as, as sort of is an activity where, where I'm kind of purposefully trying to do something. I'm purposefully trying to investigate something or think about something where, whereas awe, it's sort of like I am, um, I'm the recipient in some way yeah. of something. I, I love that distinction. That, that, I think that's perfect. You're, you're not, I mean, you're kind of trying to, to make sense of it, but the things overpowering you in some ways that you're in awe of. When you're curious or you're in wonder, you're, you're sort of the agent, the active agent trying to make sense yeah. of that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so to, to everyone here who's, who's listening, start thinking of some, some questions and topics for Josh. I have, I have one more though, which is, what do you think are the challenges um, for people having this, this meaningful existence? We, um, we asked a bunch of adults about, um, about curiosity, for example, and half of them said that they don't know how to live curiously as an adult. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear kind of with all of these people that you encounter in these studies, what you think the challenges are for people in, in trying to have this more meaningful existence. Yeah, I think, you know, you got a few things. You got, you know, culture and society and all these things, uh, you know, what where we're living now, I think can have, it can really interfere with our ability to find meaning in things. So if you think about it, like, um, you've always had developmental things like, you know, if you retire, you might lose a sense of purpose, or if your kids go to college, you might lose a sense of purpose. Those are sort of things that naturally happen, but most people gain sort of a sense of purpose. But I think now, you know, again, we're so fast paced. It's like, it's hard to sort of think about what is your purpose or why do you matter? What are you doing? And, you know, we're all sort of comparing ourselves to other people and so forth. I think, I think um, things like, you know, our technology, I, I do think, you know, technology and are just fixated on phones and things like that, it distracts from it too. I think it can, I know your websites, you know, relate to it. And so, it's kind of, but uh, if you really think about it, you know, like for some people, especially, I think it detracts from your ability to appreciate things, you know, because you're focused on these little, you know, my, uh, you know, little videos or whatever it is you're watching. You're not looking at things outside yourself in some ways. So you're not really connected to that. You're not connected to anything. I think it has a, it's gonna have a big influence and I don't think there's any data on this though, but for like um, older people, you know, when we age, I feel like this might just my own opinion, but I think that there was a time not too long ago when we looked to older people for advice, for wisdom. You know, we looked at them, we call our grandparents up, we'd ask them stories, you know, ask them, you know, questions as should say, and they tell us stories to help us make sense of things. And I feel like now, you know, we just look it up on the internet, you know, and we don't do that. And I feel like that's that's gonna be a problem. Um, you know, I could feel like from our own self doing that a lot, there's no mystery in your life anymore. You're just looking it up, right? You're not thinking about things too much, but also for the person that's used to give you the device, um, in this case, you know, a grandparent, for example, I think that, you know, it might distract from their sense of mattering too, in some ways. And so I think there's a number of ways in which technology uh, and so forth can detract from your sense of meaning. That's super interesting about, um, you know, going to your grandparents to, yeah. to answer questions for you versus the phone or, yeah. or Google. Um, I, I actually have never thought about the, the impact that that yeah. might have, like, especially later in life. Um, so yeah. that is definitely a topic for us to, explore more deep more deeply i think yeah. in the humane space um and i mean the other thing is I, I feel like you know there's so much emphasis on um on connecting on community on engaging social media for example and a lot of the activities that we're describing that we're talking about i think require a level of of introspection and and sort of quiet in your own head sort of um you know, different from, from meditation, but, but um, you know, it, it's active, you know, it's, it's sort of an active process, but it, I think it sort of does require some 
um, detachment, maybe, I don't know if that's the best word, but, um, yeah. and, and so I, I feel like that can sometimes, you know, there, there's sort of mixed, mixed things, you know, about feeling like what we're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah, it's hard to develop a clear sense of identity too when you're just connected to that. You know, I feel like you need that time to reflect on things, to figure stuff out. Um, you know, and here's a kind of a, not quite related, but how how technology is making, I think, people's lives more meaningful, but not necessarily in a good way. I feel like um, if you think about like political extremism, which is, you know, we know that polarization is like, you know, so bad in our country and other countries too right now. And, you know, if you look at people who identify, regardless of who they identify with, like, you know, people are extreme on the viewpoint, it's going to correlate with meaning in life in a positive way. You know, because if you think about what meaning in life is, coherence, purpose, and mattering, if you're extremely, you know, political, you feel like, you know, life makes sense. You know, these people are bad. I'm good. You know, I have a purpose. I need to stand up for what's right. And, you know, my actions matter. But I don't know if that's really a good thing necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good for maybe for your little in-group or big in-group in this case, but not for the other people, the out-group people. And so that's Another instance where, you know, technology is making us definitely much more polarized, less talking to each other, you know, just talking to the people who think like we think. And I think, you know, in a weird way, that's actually boosts your personal sense of meaning, but I don't think it's advancing or improving society by any means. Uh, yeah, that's also really interesting that aspects, I guess, of what might make a meaningful life could potentially be toxic for the greater, the greater yeah. For the greater good, yes. Culture, yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's really, really interesting. Um, so that was my last question, and I'm really hoping that we can get some other folks um, involved. Um, so we have one question here in the chat. Have you gained any insight on what sparks the path toward meaning? Um, is there any commonality amongst people who have become self-aware and found a comfortable relationship with meaning? Great question. Yeah, so self-awareness, or at least, again, I, I, I'm one of these people who calls myself a you know, true self-agnostic. I don't know if it exists or not, but we have a feeling that it exists. And I feel that we do know, we've done a lot of research that the more connected you feel to yourself, the more sense you feel like your life has meaning in some ways. And, it, you know, it, it, we're supposed to say their lives that we know ourselves. And you know, there's many different reasons why that might be the case. Um, and I think that self-awareness, you know, is certainly important for me, you know, knowing who you are. And I think if you look at the extreme examples of someone going through some sort of identity crisis, whether they have a personality disorder or they going through a midlife crisis or, a, um, you know, quarter life crisis or whatever it is, you know, those people are probably also going to say their lives doesn't make sense. You know, they, they, they're not going to have meaning. So it's very important. I'm sorry, what was the first part of that question? Have you gained any insight on what sparks the path toward meaning? Yeah, that's, a, you know, I think, I know like what associated with meaning. I don't know what the path to meaning though. I think you can think about it a couple of ways. You know, one of these things about like when your meaning systems break down and you don't, again, if you go through trauma or something and you can't make sense of things, what helps you sort of facilitates recovery from that? And I think things like, you know, just staying in touch with people, it's very important. I think, you know, one of the strongest predictors of meaning, no surprise, is feeling like you have close friendships. You know, it doesn't have to be the quantity of people, but feeling like you have some people close to you that you can talk to. And, you know, staying to close to people, I think, it just sort of magically makes you feel like life's meaningful in some ways. You know, even when times are bad, you feel that connection, like you, you matter, you know, things like that. I think though, most of the time though, what, you know, slowing down, as we talked about, I think appreciating beauty and sort of being more present, you know, thinking about other people and the world at large, you know, bigger thinking about, you know, how we're all in this together can make it feel more meaningful too, in some ways. Do those, you, do you worry at all about what we've seen about young people and their kind of um, struggles with 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 developing their sense of self, um, yeah. especially with the impact of social media? Uh, yeah. Would that have an impact later on on their ability yeah. to find meaning 
in yeah, life, that, do you think? That's, you know, one of my colleagues and I have been talking about this quite a bit. And, you know, we know suicide rates are higher now than they have ever been. You know, I personally think it's because their parents are so, you know, polarized politically, it has a lot to do with it, but also you have social media, you know, that's not unrelated to that, but, you know, they're just focused on that and not going out and appreciating things. And so it's, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's, you know, I think it's certainly related to it. And I, you know, I, that's one thing I do want to study. I think it's a really important question to study, you know, one of the most important ones too, you know, seeing all these people struggle. Uh, you know, just teaching at Texas A&M, which I'm sure it's like all over the world, you know, these students, you know, they're, you know, come back, to, you know, after like missing their high school graduation, missing, you know, their, their college experience, you know, you know, just being like, they, they're not like they were two years ago. And I can't blame them. You know, they're, they've been in this really bizarre situation where it's, you know, they're been expecting their whole life that this college experience would be a certain way. And it hasn't been that way. And hopefully it's getting back to normal. But you know, I think figuring out, you know, what we can do to help them, help their mental health is really one of the most important things we can do right now, I think. So Scott had a question, um, where does having a strong and growing faith fit into a meaningful life? Yeah, you know, it's very ro robustly correlated with meaning, if having faith or just being spiritual, uh, but having faith in general. Um, it's a strong correlate with meaning. And again, if you go back to the facets of meaning, we talked about coherence. Uh, people who have strong faith are more likely to say, you know, things like, you know, God has a plan for me. I know what it is, for example, you know, and your purpose, you go along with that plan. Um, and mattering too, you feel like it is. So it's, it's a robust predictor of meaning. Um, typically, you know, for most people, um, it's a strong predictor of meaning in life, having that sort of faith. Um, you have often in many people, you know, they also have this sort of interpersonal component that facilitates meaning. So if they go to, uh, you know, church, for example, or, you know, so they go to some sort of worship, you know, whatever, wherever they go, basically, they have a community that's built around them that other people don't necessarily have. You know, and that's, you know, another question I have, uh, I used to be, you know, uh, very religious. Now I'm kind of agnostic. I just, no particular reason. I just sort of lost it, you know, as I was growing up, um, like a lot of people, I think. And, you know, I think it's really important to figure out how do you, how do you get that? You know, I, you know, thinking about my kids, you know, I grew up in a wonderful, you know, church community. You know, it's little where we had this really strong bond of, you know, people around this, you know, strong social support all these good, good things and so forth. And, you know, how do I recreate it for my kids now if you know, they're not doing that and so forth? So I think that's another, you know, really important question to answer that we need to answer. So there's um, another question. Is it best to create an awe moment daily? If so, what is the likely impact of this? And I would just tack on to that. Do you, have you identified, I guess, actual health benefits beyond kind of, you know, ha feeling like your life has meaning, but, you know, physical, physical health benefits. We haven't looked at that too much. I do know that, you know, people who we call uh, are prone to awe experiences. So, you know, just they self-report that they experience awe a lot throughout the day or throughout their week um, are, you know, less depressed, you know, have higher meaning and all these things that probably correlate with physical health too, to be honest. Um, but we don't, I don't know if any research has looked at that. I don't know, you know, that's really important. So having one or doing this, I, again, I think you first have to get in that mindset. I think you, it's hard to force people to like say, oh, just experience all, go out there. <laughs> my, you know, I, I make fun of my wife, but she used to always, you know, go around the table and say, say three things you're grateful for today. I'm like, I can't think of three, you know, like it's, if you force, you force yourself to do it, sometimes it's hard to do it for some people. And I think it could backfire too, in some ways. And so I think first cultivating that mindset, you know, where you're sort of just slow down a little bit, you know, just realize that, hey, you know, I, I don't have to be glued to my phone the whole time, you know, just don't look at your phone while you walk to your car, even, you know, like it's, you might see something, you might see somebody doing something nice or something that, you know, a, a bird, you know, fly that you haven't seen before, you know, little things like that, I think can make life a little bit more do interesting. You, do you think we've gotten too scripted in our daily life? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know how it's changed or if it's changed. It feels like it is though. It feels like we it certainly, we go about the same thing, doing that same thing. And, you know, it's interesting. Some people have shown, some of my colleagues have shown that, you know, having those routines actually can make life feel meaningful too, a little bit. 
Uh, but I think when you just have those routines and you don't do something novel and other things that probably not necessarily. So. So we have another question here from, from Ed. Um, he says, you've talked a lot about the natural world. Um, a few years ago, the author Robert McFarlane and the illustrator Jackie Morris produced the book, The Lost Words, as a reaction to the loss of words used in the natural world from the dictionary. Oh. How closely is our ability to access or be mindful of thoughtfulness meaning and awe tied to the language that we use. If we lose some of that language, do we lose some ability to find meaning or awe? That's a wonderful question too. I, that's, I hadn't really thought about that, but it would make sense that, you know, if we do, if our language is getting less nuanced, you know, we're just thinking again, we're thinking more in black and white. It's probably harder to, you know, experience these types of things, experience awe, you know, see certain things and really appreciate it. Um, then if we do think about things in these more nuanced, you know, different ways, I guess. That, that's really interesting, though. I don't, you know, I didn't know, you know, that it would make sense, you know, that, that that would happen. I don't know of any studies that have looked at that, but is that great? We're giving you lots of ideas. For oh, sure. yeah. I'm writing it down. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Here's another question. How has your work affected your life and your own perception of meaning? That's a good question. And I think... Uh, I think for poor kids, it didn't too much. You know, I think to be honest, if I want to be honest, I think I was just like, I need to get publications, I need to do this, I need to get tenure, you know, all this stuff, just like somebody starting out in their career, basically. I think with kids, I think with COVID, and I think also teaching, I started teaching this existential psychology class um, with undergraduates, a really small discussion class. All three of those things in their own unique way have sort of helped me, I think. You know, listening to people, these undergrads, for example, tell about what they think life's meaningful, what their meaningful experience is. You know, all they're all have these unique perspectives, you know, on different things, and they're all super interesting. It's actually really interesting to think, you know, when people tell you what's the most meaningful experience they've had, you know, or you know, why they're afraid to, you know, why it's important to, you know, say you love people before you die, you know, and all these sort of big questions, you know, it's I think it really, it's affected me in, in, in a good way, a positive way, you know, thinking about how other people think about it. You know, seeing my kids, you know, having, having them, I definitely had to slow down, certainly you just have to, I think. And that's helped a little bit. And, and again, going back to COVID, I think that's really helped me a lot. I feel like, and again, I feel bad saying this because I know a lot of people have had a really hard time with the pandemic and, you know, I'd see, but personally, I think it's been one of the best things for me and not the pandemic itself, but just, you know, forcing myself to slow down and, you know, appreciate, you know, the people that I love and, you know, stay connected with them and so forth. So another question is how important is community to meaning um, beyond close friends or family? Yeah. Um, and have you seen any signs of a growth in small communities? Oh, I don't know. I think community, certainly feeling like you matter in some sense, the tighter the community is, I think it, it, it certainly can, you know, should facilitate meaning. Um, I feel like the same token when you're in a place where people are, you don't know if people are your enemy or friends, you know, again, this political climate, that's sort of, it's going to detract from it, you know, it, it's like, you're not going to feel like, you know, you're going to sort of be on guard more. I think, you know, it, the, the extent that you feel connected in that community, you know, whether, whether it's a big city or a small rural place, I think that's really important. And so I can see someone living in a rural place that, you know, just doesn't feel like they fit in. And maybe they don't see their sense of meaning there by any means. But other people, you know, their parents, you know, live there forever. They know, you know, they're, they're neighbors, they've known forever. You know, all these certain things I think certainly contribute to your sense of coherence and things like that. You feel like you're, you're you feel like you matter because you're part of, of a community. And so have, have you read anything or have you explored any um, differences between meaningful lives in like rural communities versus urban areas? No, I haven't actually. Um, I don't know the literature. I'm sure someone has looked at that, you know, in some ways. I, I, I don't know though, to be honest. Um, again, it, it's probably a little function of your personality too, in some ways. Um, and, and your state of mind. You know, I lived in San Francisco, I went to undergrad there. 
Um, and, you know, it's great, beautiful city. You should find beauty and everything around it. And I did for two and a half years. It was wonderful. It's the best thing in my life. And then, you know, my girlfriend broke up with me and my life was, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. And it's like, you know, then you can't appreciate anything in some ways. And I wanted to move to a less hectic place. And I, so I think, again, it's probably a function of where you are and, you know, your interests and who you are and, you know, how, how you can feel comfortable, basically, in some ways. So I know Rachel has a question. Yeah. Oh, I think you muted. You're muted. <laughs> Hi, um, Hi. My name is Rachel. As you know, Josh, I'm also with the Humane Space. Everyone, hello to everyone else. Um, so I'm currently based out of Mexico City, um, but I'm from the United States. And I do a lot of research on cultural index and how different countries relate. Um, the US rates high on the significance of individuality and social media reinforces this in some ways, but it also encourages a certain homogeneity. I mean, it's not, it's not so different than what we've seen year, you know, I mean, over the years in terms of, of print media, beauty, health, wellness, and, and what those, those definitions mean. So do you approach this duality with your students or help them untangle it to find their own way and on a path to discerning what meaning is for themselves? So, so what, what's the exact question though? Like just their, the culture and like, Yes. Um, I mean, I'm comparing it across cultures because, yeah. for instance, um, in, in Mexico, there's um, there's a lot of uh, uh, there's uh, I, I hesitate to make generalizations, but yeah. um, but a, a focus on family and yeah. within the family, um, there there might be less individuality or or or, or different roles. And yeah. so so the question is. Um, um, you know, compared to the U.S., where on a cultural index, individuality rates high. Yeah. Um, I, sometimes that can be confusing, especially when we have so much um, noise from social media. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, as a professor, do you approach this topic with your students or is your work in a, in a different capacity? So not explicitly, I guess, you know, uh, that's a really another great question. You know, it's something that people will bring it up, especially in my class, you know, people often bring up cultural differences and, you know, it, it's a great point because, you know, individuality, you know, should be, it seems like it's related to purpose and all this stuff. And, you know, it's there, I don't think there's a difference if you look at correlations between you know, people living in different cultures, but maybe your sense of meaning, the type of meaning you have, I think when you feel connected to other people, you know, family and you feel like your, your goals are, you know, connected to other you know, people and community and so forth. You know, my personal feeling is that it's maybe on a self-report, your meaning doesn't differ in some ways, but at some other level, you know, it's like more authentic meaning in some ways, just feeling more connected to things than if you're just pursuing your own goals and their, their goals are not related to other people. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, again, that's, I realize everyone pursues their own goals and everyone feels connected to something. But as you mentioned, there's these cultural differences too that um, I think, you know, you can live in wherever and, and have that sort of maintain that sort of connectedness to family. But we, we don't do that as much, I think, in, our, in the United States at least. We, ha we have like a number of other really super fascinating questions for you, Josh. Um, so one of them is how do the perceptions of others public recognition, gratification, et cetera, play a role in meaning? Is it important to separate ourselves from being dependent on others yeah. or our impact on others to construct yeah. healthy feelings of meaning or is that a natural element of meaning? That's another good question. It's, uh, it, I think it depends. I mean, I think it affects meaning and happiness, certainly both of them. And so, you know, others, I don't know, again, I don't think you disconnect yourself from others per se, but maybe like sort of feeling like you're, you know, how you're valued by them, always comparing yourself to other people and, and getting your self-worth based on other people, how they view you, uh, we know is not good. You know, it's usually associated with things like depression and things like that. If, if all you care about, if your goals related to, you know, how other people think about you, 
if you want to be rich, if you want to be attractive, if you want to be all these things, you know, by themselves are not necessarily bad, but if you do that and you value it over having close relationships and these other personal growth and, you know, my guess is mystery and things like that and awe, you know, then I think it, it becomes maladaptive in some ways uh, because you can't control it. You can't control what you, you know, what you look like. Yeah, you can kind of control it, but not really because you're always, you know, in this mind set of like, oh, you know, do other people think I look like this? And, it's, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing. Josh, what, what do you think about ambiguity? Um, you know, talking about kind of mystery and, yeah. and ambiguity, do, do you feel like people are, are comfortable with ambiguity um, or, or do you need to sort of try and be a little more, like not always yeah. need the answers to things? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, so we know there's a lot of individual differences in that, you know, some people are fine with ambiguity, they actually like it in some ways, and some people, they need that, you know, sort of, they need it for them, and, uh, you know, it has to be clear, they have to make sense of it right away, and so forth. How would it relate? I feel like, you know, when you think about mystery, going back to that example of that, I think, you know, it's, it's sort of related to it in some ways, maybe not ambiguity so much, but somewhat tied to it, I think. You know, where you're like, just not sure you go back and forth about things, you know, and you're thinking about it, you know, why did this happen? Why did, you know, what happened on this thing? And it sort of makes life interesting, makes it meaningful, worthwhile in some ways. So I think in that sense, it's, you know, kind of a good thing. If you didn't have ambiguity, you wouldn't have to search for answers to it, I think, because you know it, right? And so with a little bit of ambiguity for some people, I think sometimes can be worthwhile. So John is asking, is there a correlation between consumption of mass media and its effect on one's sense of self or and or meaning? Yeah. And so um, I know there's a correlation between the two, uh, between consumption of mass media and like well-being, especially for children. Um, there's a lot of studies going, going out for, you know, how the internet and just, you know, just focus on screens, for example, or, you know, erode well-being. And so, you know, it would make sense, uh, like I said before, that it's going to detract from your sense of meaning in some ways too, you know, too much of it. And again, it's always like this balance between, you know, if you're just prioritizing that, you're not prioritizing these other things it's probably not going to go well for you in many ways. I mean, you're not going to be as happy as you want to be. You're not going to experience meaning in any way. You're not going to experience awe or beauty as much either. Even though it seems like you should because, you know, you're on a phone, for example, and you can look up anything you want to, but, you know, it's, it's not quite as satisfying as that, you know, just coming upon it. Um, and then we're, we're coming up here on, on 50 minutes. So if you have any other questions, you know, please do post them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, here's, here's one. Are you aware of any consumer brands that are intentionally aiming product services, brands, um, et cetera, clearly at wonder, curiosity, awe, or meaning? Disney, like Disney, Meta, Hallmark, Travel and Leisure, Smithsonian. Um, I can definitely think of one. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But... Um, I'm, I'm curious about what you think about the ones that, that were listed here or any others really. Yeah. You know, I, I forget who it was, I think it was meta when Facebook first came out, I think they, you know, I think I remember seeing an ad like find yourself be, or maybe it wasn't that I actually don't want to say it's somebody said that somewhere or some, some company said that. And I remember thinking like, it's probably not the best way to do it, to be honest, because again, you're not focus on the self. You're not doing that introspection. You're just, you know, going down these rabbit holes of looking at things you're already into, it seems like. I don't know. Um, I think, you know, things that sort of, I think the good apps are probably be the ones like yours and the ones that sort of make you slow down. You know, I haven't, you know, these med mindfulness apps and things like that and meditation apps, because that again, gets you that sort of mindset that helps you sort of appreciate beauty, appreciate things more, which will inherently give your life more meaning. Um, I, I don't think I see any other questions here. I'll just kind of wrap up with, with something that you and I talked about when, when we first spoke, which was that um, a lot of this was about finding your truest self. And I thought that that, that was a really compelling way to, to think about it. And um, I, I don't know that 
many of us go through our daily lives thinking that we're not connected to our truest yeah. selves. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I, I'd love to just hear your thoughts on, on, on that concept on, on sort of finding your truest self. Yeah, that's so a, a lot of research, including a lot that we've done in our lab has looked at sort of what predicts true self feeling like, you know, who you are. It seems like the main thing is like, you know, whether you do morally good things, you know, helping other people and so forth. I feel like that's sort of the main thing. People who do that feel like they know who they are. Um, and conversely, we ran some studies where we had people think about the moral acts they've done in the past week, college students, everyone's done some sort of a moral act, you know, in some ways, whether it's, you know, lying to the professor, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, after doing that, they report like they don't owe themselves very well. So it seems like our sense of morality, a lot of people have shown, there's been a lot of studies, probably 30 studies by now that's shown that our sense of morality is inherently tied to our true self in some ways. And I think doing things, you know, they, Morality is, I realize, a big term, but you know, I think it, you know, many ways it boils down to helping other people in some ways. You know, being pro-social, helping other people, doing good for other people, not just yourself. I think doing that, I think you feel more connected to yourself. It's easier to do it. Uh, you know, it's a tricky thing too. It's hard to know who you are, and I, we probably make all these weird beliefs. We have all these weird beliefs about who we are that may or may not be true. I think it's you know thinking about focusing on what we do, you know, getting some introspection of what we actually do can give us some insight into who we are too. Instead of thinking about who you want to be or who, you know, your little true self in your head is, you know, like, what do you actually do? It can give you some insight if you just focus on that, of who you are, the type of person you are. Well, I think that's a, a wonderful way to wrap up this conversation. It certainly gives me a lot to think about. And I hope Josh, that you'll come back and talk to us um, yeah. again about yeah. the research you're, you're doing now. Um, you gave well, me 20 study ideas, so I appreciate <laughs> everyone that gave a question. It was really wonderful, yeah. Uh, really incredibly interesting. And um, for those of you still watching, we will um, uh, post the recording of this. So in case you missed part of it, you can certainly come back and, and take a look. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you again ne next time. All right, thank you all.